Hello everybody and welcome back. We are here to discuss a camera long coming as a review. I've been on vacation, so fair excuse there if I may let myself off the hook. But as well, I was not sure how to do this review because this camera has been so monumental in my life. So to talk about it, we are gonna have to roll it back. was a truly accessible, easy to navigate, full frame digital SLR, which led to a huge amount of mass migration and adoption to digital at a time when film was still king. It did so by having really amazing color science and really remarkable digital performance for its time. And I would argue for today. It is a wonderful camera and we are gonna dive very deeply into it, but we're gonna start high level once again with some real bulleted spec. Released in 2005, it has 12.8 megapixels, a CMOS full frame sensor. It has RAW and JPEG capability. It has nine autofocus points, EF lens mount, uh, ISO 100 to 1600 with a low and high boost mode of 50 up to 3200. It has a shutter speed of up to one eight thousandth of a second, and it takes CF cards for its memory, good old CF, and a very easy to find, very common, oh, I don't have it in here, uh, BL, gosh, BP511 battery, and that's it. That's all there is to this camera. It is so simple, it is so no frills, but that's what I love about this camera so much. It is very easy to use, there is no bells and whistles, but what it does, it does very well. So well, in fact, that even though it was released in 2005, when I got married 10 years later, my photographer showed up with this camera, this lens, the 50 millimeter 1.2, and a 35 millimeter 1.4 shot my entire wedding with just that setup. And those images are still some of my all time favorites. They are timeless, they are classic, and it just shows that this camera ages very well. Welcome to the absolutely stunning Koya National Park. I have never been here before and it is heaven on earth. And we happen to be here at a time where there aren't that many people here. A lot of the park is still closed from all the rain and, and stuff that happened in California this past winter. I am shooting this trip 
on a digital camera in a film-like style whereby I have to get it right in camera. I am shooting JPEG only, and I am not touching any of my images with any post-processing, not even leveling the image um, or any of that, so that I can just get the most present experience of being here and not opening up my computer at night or spending any of that time that I could be spending elsewhere um, doing the things that I also love. There's nothing against that, and I will go back to that. I still shoot raw 99% of the time. But I thought this would be a good challenge to myself. It's honestly really hard for me to shoot this way. I also added to this challenge this little screen here. These were to protect um, your screen from sun. So you'd flip it up like that, and you'd be able to see your image better. Um, but what I've done is just kept it like that so that I can't... Um, I can't peep. And that's really, 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 really hard. And I gotta, I, I'll be honest, like, I am peeping because I'm like, I have to get this right in camera. I want to make sure that I'm, like, metering correctly here, especially with forests and very high contrast lighting. I don't know what I'm going to get, guys. So, um, we're going to cut to me back home where I actually download these images and we can kind of review them and see how it all worked out. <laughs> So that screen idea on the back, purest as it was, I liked it in principle, but it was extremely annoying and inefficient. But the JPEG output of this was extraordinary. It was, oh, I, I'm really happy with all the images I got. And when it hit, it hit. It's just, there is something to the color rendition of this, the contrast, the saturation, everything about it. These images are just special out of this camera. Now, everything I shot on that Sequoia trip was shot in its standard default profile. Um, and where I really started to have fun with this camera was when I went and got a little bit more in depth in the menus and started to customize my color profiles a little bit more. Now, there's really very little that you can do. There's not a lot of customization, but I found that moving to a different profile and then just dialing in a few of my settings to the place where I got just the color that I was really happy with um, made all the difference. And that's how I kind of shot this for the majority of the remainder of this review. I find that this camera just nails certain colors in a way that I don't see on a lot of other digital cameras, like the reds and the blues and even the greens, just there's something so rich and satisfying about the color. It's interesting, a lot of people, I mean, so many people have asked me to compare this to the D700. And while this is not going to be an in-depth comparison, because I did just review the D700, I will comment on it a bit. I find the color profiles of the D7, D700 to be much more natural, much more neutral. Um, really great if you want something that feels organic. This is much more stylized and to me, frankly, a bit more filmic um, because the colors aren't necessarily natural, but they're very pleasing. The white balance on auto as well as the auto exposure is really good on this camera. Uh, generally speaking, it it hits almost all the time. There are going to be circumstances where it gets thrown, but most cameras do like a deep dark forest. It's going to try to hit that for, you know, 50% middle gray, and then it's going to overexpose it, et cetera, et cetera. So you do need to start to take into control your exposure triangle in those circumstances and even your white balance. But 
auto white balance 99.9% .9 of the time does the job. Again, the simplicity of this camera, as I mentioned, was that one scrolling menu page, which I love in many ways. One thing that does frustrate me though, is that you do have to kind of go into the menus a fair amount to get to those things. Um, so that can be a little bit finicky. Like every time you wanna format the card, you have to like scroll all the way down. It does, that's annoying. Um, Another thing with this body, as you can see, there are far fewer buttons than there are on the D700. The D700 has a bespoke button for almost every feature you would ever need. You do not have to go into the menus with that camera. If you do go into the menus, they're much more complicated than this Canon 5D, but it's also much more feature rich. This Canon 5D has far fewer buttons in an effort, again, I think to simplify, um, and I don't mind it. It has dual function buttons. So this button has AF plus white balance functions, drive plus ISO. It just means that it's a two handed operation. So every time you want to do that, um, you know, you're either doing the back scroll wheel with one of these held down or the front scroll wheel to do the other function of that one button. If you do want to do custom white balance, that's one thing in here that's very annoying because I do like to do a lot of white custom balance, custom white balance and you have to go into the menu, do like a bunch of buttons. It's, it's a very inefficient thing. Whereas on the D700, it's like one button, you can set the white balance. This has far more steps. Um, so ergonomically menus wise, button wise, this is, you know, sub optimal. The other thing, and this one is a real bummer, a heart hitter for me, um, there's no built-in flash. The D700 has the built-in flash. This does not, uh, I don't, you know, you could use any manual flash with this. I don't have a Canon TTL flash to use with this. I might get one because I really love flash. I love flash, it's just, meh. I really just wish it was built in. I love me a level. There's no virtual horizon on this. It's a very simple viewfinder. The information is very sparse in there. It's, uh, you know, not as good a viewfinder as again, the D700. The D700 was made for a, I, I would say a much more professional audience. This does feel a bit more prosumer. It was used by a lot of pros. So it's not to say it's not a professional camera, but it doesn't feel as robust as full featured as anything that the D700 has to offer. It's definitely a more plasticky body. Um, again, not as many buttons on the body. On the upside, it's very light. It's lighter and smaller than the D700 in a big and noticeable way, um, but it doesn't have kind of the, the professional guts that the D700 clearly brought to the table. One thing that I absolutely love about this is the EF mount is like the most universal mount. So you can adapt pretty much anything to this. And that is key because I've been adapting my old OM Suico lenses. I have an Olympus OM4 film camera, which I absolutely freaking adore. And I have um, a couple of zoom ranges, uh, zoom lenses for that. I have a 28 millimeter f 2.8. I have a 50 millimeter 1.8. I have a 100 millimeter 2.8. I just love those lenses. They are so beautiful and so wonderful. And to adapt them onto this body shook me. Like I couldn't believe how well they performed with this sensor. They were sharp. They were full of contrast. They had beautiful color and they gave this a much more analog feel than even the native glass on here. The native glass is great. EF lenses are great, but using it with those adapted Zuiko lenses just gave it vibe that I really dug. It's also like wickedly affordable. You can also adapt the Nikon glass from my D700 onto this body. So the two biggest things I think that really stand out to me between the D700 and the 5D are the autofocus and the ISO, um, the or rather the implementation of those things. So the autofocus on this is nine point, the autofocus on the D700 is 51 point, and the difference is absolutely um, felt when you're shooting these cameras. This one definitely hesitates, it can be slow, and it doesn't really lock or feel super confident in its autofocus, whereas the D700 is like bang, 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 bang. 
you are good to go. Um, I, you know, really never hesitated to feel like I got the shot with that one. Whereas this, I definitely do, but it's also just like being realistic with what you're shooting. Like I'm not shooting super action related items with this camera. It's just not what it's for. Um, for just day to day, everyday scenes, or even just my kids for the most part, I'm not too worried about it. It definitely slows down in lower light, but it's totally capable for most, you know, needs. So it's not something to get, it's not, a, again, a deal breaker. It's not something to get super hung up on. One thing though that people will get hung up on, I think, is there is absolutely no auto ISO in this. So you really do need to know your exposure triangle and be working your exposure triangle when you're shooting this. This is not a passive camera. You do need to know what you're doing and how to shoot it. Um, you know, that, that's not to say like you're radically changing things all the time. You can shoot on aperture priority mode and just leave it at ISO 400 and like film, you're going to be covered in most circumstances. So not too big of a deal, but something to note, whereas like D700 has auto ISO, which does make life a little easier. So again, the main takeaway is like the D700 is the more professional camera. It does more. It's also heavier. It's more robust. It has, you know, the... This is more the hobbyist camera. It's like not a plow on the D700. I love the D700. I'm keeping the D700. This is more of the hobbyist, like maybe more of the artist, more of the, I don't know. The D700, I would say the files are more flexible as well. I think these raw files are not as flexible as the D700, but these just come out done. Like they're baked. You don't have to do anything more with them. Whereas with the D700, I felt like I wanted to manipulate them more and to a, almost to a detriment sometimes. Um, these are just one and done. This is the closest thing. This is going to sound insane and ridiculous. This is the closest thing to like what I wish a Fuji camera output, but which I never really got with my Fuji cameras. I have a Fuji camera right now that may change my mind. More on that later. But... Um, I just love the way these come out of the camera. They're just, oh, chef's kiss. Now here's another crazy thing about the Canon 5D, which I did not know. Just like the D700 where I showed you, um, you could download picture profiles and install them on your computer via like an SD card. You can do a similar thing with the Canon 5D. I was like, I couldn't believe that this was possible. I was initially trying to do it by doing um, like a virtual machine on my Mac. I have an M1 Mac, set up a virtual machine. I went into the internet archive and like found all the crap that I needed to load my Canon software to be able to plug my camera into that. And anyway, this is a long way of saying I spent a full one and a half days doing all of this and it just kept failing and I could not figure out what was going on. Well, if you have a computer that has an M1 chip, just don't do this. Um, it doesn't work. It just literally doesn't work. There's a break in the something or other and it just cannot be loaded on an M1. If you have an older laptop from Mac and wanna run a virtual machine, you can do it that way. The easiest thing to do and what I happen to have because I'm a freaking crazy person is an old uh, Toshiba laptop, which I was uh, able to load Windows XP onto and then find that software again, load that software from Canon on here and get the profiles onto my camera. That was very easy when I realized I could just use my old computer, which I completely forgot that I had bought for a different camera way back in the day. So that's definitely the easiest thing, but oh, trying to do this on my Mac was just brutal. And frankly, I don't think any of it was worth it because the best profiles are the ones just already in the camera. But I did like trying some of these other profiles. I tried a Kodachrome profile because I'm very obsessed with Kodachrome and it was nice. It gave a really cool, unique look. Um, not my favorite look and I still would prefer to use my faithful settings in the default menu. However, if you would like to try this, I'm going to put a bunch of links down below because, oh my God, I, I did way too much research and I'm not going to just keep that to myself. So feel free, have at it. If you want to just like spend a day going down the rabbit hole of Windows XP. All right. So just a few last things that I jotted down to cover before we wrap this up. The lens I used probably the most was this good old <laughs> brick, this 24 to 70 2.0 
8 Mark 1 L lens. Now, hot tip for you, I got this lens for chips because one, the filter is damaged here, but I'm shooting up to one eight hundred eight thousandth of a second, so I don't really worry about needing to put ND filters on this. I'm also not using this for video. I don't have a camera with video capabilities. Note, the, the Mark I 5D does not have video. That was not until the Mark II. For some reason, people get that really confused. They think that the Mark I was the groundbreaking one that had video. That was actually the Mark II. There was no video on Mark I, um, just the 5D Classic, no video. Keep that in mind. So I don't worry about video, so I'm not putting ND filters on here. So the filter is a little bit busted. I can't get an ND on here. And there is a nice little scratch, which I don't know if you can see here, right on the lens. Um, let me see if I can get a good shot here. No, I can't. Um, oh, geez. Anyway, there is a scratch right across the front of this lens, and it is a visible scratch. And you know what? It doesn't matter. You do not see anything in the final image that is affected by that scratch. Um, there's a really fun old article where they like completely smashed up like the front of a lens and it still performed almost perfectly. So don't be afraid of lenses that are imperfect. They will still perform pretty damn well, especially on older vintage digital cameras that don't have the resolution to really show these imperfections. As far as things that I really wish this had, which it doesn't, is there's one custom setting on here. So like if you wanted to set this up a particular way and save it as a custom setting, there's only one option for that. I really wish there were more. I also wish there were more like custom um, color profiles that you could save in the menu. It's just, it's just a really simple camera and there aren't. So you get one custom setting, which is definitely a bit of a bummer. Far more available on the D700. At high ISO, this still performs pretty well. Uh, not, not like the autofocus or anything like that, but like the digital grain structure is really nice at high ISO. I think it's because the pixel pitch of this like sensor because it's 12 megapixels or 12.8 me megapixels. And while the dynamic range of this is definitely limited, like it does blow out, the way that it blows out, the roll off in the highlights is really remarkable. Like it feels very smooth. Like it feels like a curve. It doesn't feel like a clip, which is very unusual for digital. Um, and so whatever kind of voodoo magic they did in the, in the um, the JPEG engine here was really nice and, and I think really good. And the last thing I have to say is, damn, I love this camera. I love this camera so much. And in some ways, when I think about starting this journey, this project, one a month, two cameras, like what I was looking for in a camera largely comes down to this. Like it comes back to probably me just trying to find that quality of the images I originally shot on this back in 2009. I think this is kind of the colors and the feel that I was going for um, this whole time in a lot of ways. Now, is this the only camera I'm gonna keep because it's perfect? No, I love it. It has its place in my cabinet, um, but there's definitely shortcomings and things I don't love about it. I don't really love the raw files. I think they come off the camera looking really nice, but they don't have as much flexibility as say the, the Nikon D700, in my experience, at least as far as my processing skills are concerned. Um, so there is that, but I just, as far as a JPEG engine and color science, this tops the pile for me. I just absolutely love the way the images come off of this straight out of camera. All right, folks, we did it. That's it. That's the Canon 5D Classic. We did it, we covered it. I won't be selling it. It will be staying with me. Surprise, I know, um, was not. I am really, I am really starting to cut down on my cameras and start selling things that um, are either backups or not needed or whatnot. So I do have an eBay store. I'll put the link down below. You can follow me on One Month Two Cameras on Instagram and on threads. On Instagram, I'm really just relegating most of my content there to the actual camera I'm shooting for that block of time, two weeks. Threads, 
it's just me. I just do what I want on that channel. I don't do X, whatever, oh, Elon. And um, yeah, so that, that's what's happening there. And I'll see you in the next video. Until then, mwah, I love you. Bye.